Bring your word near to us, O God. May it rest not only on our lips, but also reside in our hearts. By the power of the Holy Spirit, help us respond to your word with our whole lives until you become our dwelling place. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. The reading from the Psalms today is from Psalm 91, verses one through two and nine through 16. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. The New Testament reading this morning comes from the Gospels, the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. And Luke writes, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where, he, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these, this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him. It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, You will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Several weeks ago, I had a sad journey to take. A man I deeply respected, loved, and was humbled to call friend and mentor, had passed away. And Bob's family decided that they would have a small memorial service in Pittsburgh, so one Saturday morning I got up and left here and drove to Pittsburgh to attend that small service in honor of him, celebrating his life and all that he meant to so many people, and then drove back. But on the way between here and Columbus, as Mary Lou Baker knows, there is some construction going on. 
and they warned you as you were getting closer to the construction. Road work ahead, under construction, and so forth. And while in Pittsburgh, I happened to also notice a very pleasant way of saying it, something to the effect of, sorry about this, we're trying to do a facelift. Thank you for being patient with us. These are all signs that we use or that are used to inform us of something ahead. But they reminded me also of something I had read some time back that went like this. A road needs illumination, especially when there is a fork ahead. And that got me to thinking about this sermon, a sermon that's still under construction, if you will. When things like construction zones or forks arise, it's best to be prepared, to be aware of what's up ahead of you, to watch for the signs, because they're warning you, they're informing you. And the fact of the matter is, life is a journey, isn't it? A journey we travel that has some rough patches along the way that need attention, that have some warning signs we need to be aware of to illuminate our journey and to try to help us in navigating around or through those various passages because these construction zones of life demand decisions to be made. Now, sort of on a side note, I already know there are some people that love this movie, and maybe you've seen it. If you haven't, I encourage you to go to the internet, Google it, and watch it if you can. Comes out from 1991 long before many of you were born. But it was called Fried Green Tomatoes, and I loved it. I can't tell you how many times I've watched it, but I haven't seen it in years, so I'm allowing my memory to take advantage of me at this moment. There's a scene in there that involves the actress Kathy Bates. And I think it's a wonderful scene. It says so much, as do many of them, coming out of that movie. But this one in particular st stood out to me. She is playing the character of a woman that I would say has been taken advantage of quite a bit over the years. And as the movie progresses, she is, if you will, coming of age coming into her own, learning to stand up for herself. Well, one day, this scene shows her trying to get into a tight parking spot in a lot because she's going into shop. And it's a very tight spot that she has for a big car, so she finally decides after trying a few times to swoop out a little so that she can come in direct into it. And as she's swooping out, two young teenage and entitled, snobby kids, young people, in a little car, swoop in right away and take her spot, jump out of the car, and they're walking away. And Bates' character calls out very politely, I thought, young ladies, young ladies, that was my spot you took. And they looked at her, looked back at the spot they had taken, flipped her off, and said, we're younger and we're faster. The next scene I remember is a big car slamming into a smaller car and then backing out and slamming in again, and backing out and slamming in again. And two young ladies come running out of the mall, 
screaming and all sorts of things, and they're saying, lady, lady, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? On and on and on. And the only thing that the character in the car, Kathy Bates, says is, because I'm older and I'm insured. <laughs> well, her response got me to thinking, Though entertaining, I wouldn't advise it, and I'm not advising you to do that the next time. But for me, it also speaks to one of the core values that I think is American. Not to sound too patriotic at this point, but one of the core values here is freedom of expression. And that's an important thing, but it doesn't go without a response. We're free to express our opinions on a variety of things, almost anything, but with this freedom comes a responsibility. It's telling us we're responsible for the choices we make. No choice in life comes without responsibility. And as we all know too well, our journey in this life is filled with a lot of forks in the road, a lot of construction zones, a lot of things requiring our immediate attention that will impact us, that will impact our journey, our very lives, and require choices to be made, choices that will determine our destiny so the word of warning that flashes in my head when I say that is, we'd better be wise in making those choices. Now Jesus was just starting his ministry. And he followed or was led by the Spirit into one of these construction zones. Luke puts it this way because it's the first two verses in Luke that I find fascinating here because they show two dramatically different phrases. Led by the Spirit, tempted by the devil. This is how Luke puts it. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Now let's take that account and put it next to Matthew's account of this very same event. In Matthew it says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Matthew seems to imply to me that the Spirit intentionally took Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. While Luke is saying that while in the wilderness, having been led there by the Spirit, Jesus is tempted by the devil. That's how I read it. Now, it may be semantics to some of you, but to me, it's vitally important. For in Luke's account, we're seeing Jesus, seeing the Spirit leading Jesus into this place where he is confronted by temptation. I also, doing a little exegesis here, or eisegesis, I should say, I also see this time in the wilderness as possibly being a time for Jesus to take a moment to prepare himself for what lies ahead, to be in prayer, to be in meditation, to be, make this part of his spiritual journey as he is about to head out into the world 
with this radical message he is about to share. Now, I'm not denying it. This is a text that requires a lot of looking at, a lot of study. And it's a struggle, no denying that. Do you see the Spirit leading Jesus into temptation, or do you see the Spirit leading Jesus into the wilderness? And then, while there, he is tempted. Luke's passage, though, reminds me of our need to be vigilant. Vigilant because temptation is always present. And no matter how holy, how spiritual, how prayerful, how pious, how spiritually disciplined we may think we are, we are constantly being exposed to temptation. And we need to remember that. A number of years ago, an esteemed writer that many know, J.B. Phillips, wrote a book that you may not know the author, but may know of the title, Your God is Too Small. A wonderful little, little book. But I'm wondering if there shouldn't be another book entitled, Your Devil is Too Small. And the reason I suggest this is because we may seem to have minimized temptation's presence in our lives. I'm not asking for a show of hands, but I would raise my hand to that. I think we've minimized it in our lives, the whole fact of temptation and of such spirits as that. And by doing so, we've deceived ourselves into thinking that we can claim to be sinless, to be immune from sin. And yet by doing so, we're simply exposing ourselves, making us more vulnerable and bigger targets to that very thing we don't think tempts us, temptation. Have we convinced ourselves of that? Do you think we've done it? Do you think that by saying we follow Jesus Christ, that because we're good, honest, decent, caring people who do the right thing, support the right causes, vote for the right candidates, think the right way, worship the right God and believe the right things, do you think we're saved, that we're no longer tempted? If that's the case, my friends, we've got bigger problems than any of us realize. Let's be clear. As followers of Jesus Christ, we must choose to be led by the Spirit but that doesn't exempt us from the challenges of life, the struggles of daily living, and the temptations that are always, always present. And part of why I say this is because of one of the most wonderful gifts I think God's given to us, but it's a double-edged sword. It's the gift of free will. Free will lets us choose the path we'll take. Good, bad, easy, challenging, familiar, unknown, and so forth. But this freedom to choose, to make decisions, comes with a responsibility. It's given to us in love, but there is a responsibility. Natural consequences. And the reality is that temptation is always there. And whatever our choices may be, there are going to be those consequences we have to live with. 
And some of them will be wonderful and we can celebrate and be grateful for, but other consequences won't be as wonderful and as good and as grateful for receiving. And we need to be aware of that. We need to know that under these situations, we are always exposed to other forces. Our responsibility is to read the road signs. Our responsibility is to be prepared for what lies ahead. Our responsibility is to make the best, most informed, most faith-centered choice that we can. And sometimes that means wonderful things. But sometimes it also means that we're paddling upstream against the current of popular opinion. Sometimes it means we're going in a direction that others aren't going in. Sometimes it means we're doing what we have prayerfully thought and believed is right in spite of the fact that we're being vilified every step of the way. Sometimes it means that by doing what we honestly, sincerely, prayerfully believe is right will send us to a cross. That's the wonderful, challenging, radical example that you and I have willingly taken on as disciples of the living Christ. And what's more is that even in tempting moments, as we travel through each day, the wonderful thing about it all is that we go with a sense of hope, a sense of assurance, a sense of God's presence in and through Jesus Christ. Because we go as followers of Jesus who has shown us the way, the truth, the light. And that gives me reassurance and hope. This morning I chose to focus on the road signs because I think they are the underpinnings of what lies ahead as we step toward the cross over these next days and weeks. We're always going to be tempted. That's a given. But if we're aware of those possible temptations, then I think we're prepared to see what the road signs are telling us and to making the decision that is a Christ-centered decision because that's part of the Lenten season of learning to be vigilant and to being prepared for that fork in the road. So keep your eyes open, your minds alert, your toes moving so you can move from side to side if necessary. And be vigilant as you travel to the cross this Lenten season. Let us pray. We are here, O oh Lord, because we have chosen to be here. We've chosen to follow you through your Son, Jesus the Christ. And we've chosen to be prepared and vigilant for what lies ahead. For as we take those steps to the cross, we know we are going to be challenged. And in those challenges, we will find strength and hope and assurance. In those challenges, we will find that which informs us and reminds us that we are disciples of the living Christ. 
So make us keenly aware. Illuminate that journey and give us that which we need to make those choices that will honor you and glorify the name of our Lord, Jesus the Christ. Amen.